speak of that. I am from a, a country where ascetic doctors and Puritan priests have led a 300-year-long crusade against the pleasure-giving qualities of food and against sensuality as such. For centuries, the idea of preparing wonderful meals for your loved ones was considered a sin in line with theft, exaggerated dancing, incest, and masturbation. <laughs> the philosophy so successfully communicated by these fine people was that if you want to live a long and healthy life on earth and avoid going to hell, just eat something of inferior taste and get it over with in a hurry. It was in this exact spirit that I was brought up in a middle-class family in the 60s, the darkest period of Danish food history. <laughs> My mother represented the first generation of Danish women working outside the home. My parents raised me on a, in the era of sauce coloring and of the stock cube on a diet composed of unorganic, chopped, fatty and cheap meat and frozen vegetables pre-boiled years before in Kazakhstan all stocked in massive chest freezers in our basement. Most of the meat was wrapped in toasted breadcrumbs three or four times and deep fried in margarine packed with trans fatty acids. We used the excess margarine for dipping. So at the age of 14, I weighed 97 kilos and I was one of the three fattest kids in Southern Denmark. As you may recall at this point, eating in my childhood was never a matter of reaching out for the beauty of life. It was a matter of economical efficiency. Food should be cheap and prepared and eaten in less than 30 minutes. Not only was the food culture of my childhood unsustainable, it was also undelicious. My mother and my father's generation didn't have the bandwidth to capture the scope of their losses. My parents didn't choose for the future they chose for themselves. And in 1977, when I was 14 years old, they decided to divorce. That happened literally to the sound of the microwave oven. <laughs> what then radically changed my life was one year spent as an au pair in Gascony, France, with a fourth generation French chef baker, Guy Sud, and his wife, Elizabeth. The meals and the time we spent preparing them was the antithesis of life with my parents. Also, Guy and Elizabeth couldn't have children and they had always wanted a son. The short story of that defining chapter of my life was that we felt like a match made in heaven and that I went back to Denmark with a calling. I wanted to try to change the food culture of my country. I opened my first restaurant when I was still studying and basically spent the next 15 to 20 years without much of a strategy, running around trying to repair on the vast array of food cultural imperfections I stumbled across. With a certain success, yes, but in the big picture with a very limited impact. Then in 2001, I figured out that maybe it would be more efficient for a while to try to take a top-down approach. Timing seemed right, the French cuisine had lost momentum and the Spanish cuisine, undisputedly celebrated for the previous 10 years, had increasingly alienated itself from nature, leaning towards molecular gastronomy where the chef alchemist uses artificial additives if needed to take the food to some sort of next level. We decided to do two things. One was to open a restaurant that should explore ancient Nordic cooking techniques invent new ones, and work solely with local produce, which at that time was a totally outrageous idea. I onboarded a very young Brenda Recebi as head chef and offered him a partnership. The second thing we did was to start working on a manifesto with the dream of, of capturing within it the big picture. Our ambition uh, was not to win missioning stars. It was to change the system, to change the current paradigm, and we figured out that we would need to engage the most important stakeholders in our agenda before the desired change would hopefully produce itself bottom up, and for that we needed a guiding light. 
I remember we rode in the first menu at Noma. With this restaurant, we want to create a new Nordic cuisine that brightens the world by virtue of its great taste and its unique character. Pretty pretentious, you may think. And you're right. But then again, the point is that food matters beyond pleasure. 90% being lost in less than a century, we are right now once again in the middle of a process of mass extinction on uh, the biological life on Earth. This time, as it has been so clearly pointed out tonight, uh, life is, is destroying itself. In a period of just about 150 years, one very intelligent species is more or less single-handedly demolishing its own livelihood as well as large parts of the biosphere. One billion people are suffering from hunger and poverty, and it is very sad that uh, far more than another billion people at the same time are suffering from obesity. But then again, man holds a unique position amongst all the living creatures on Earth. Evolution has provided us with the ability to think and to show compassion. And that is probably why we are also all here tonight to try to figure out how each of us can become a larger part of the solution. Luxury in 2003 was about foie gras, truffles, lobster and caviar, hand iron, tablecloths, fine dining for the few. We wanted to redefine luxury. We felt that also humble ingredients and a naked table could somehow, under the right circumstances, represent luxury as well. We wanted to emphasize seasonality and restore the link between cooking and nature. We wanted to document that food could be compatible, great food could be compatible with healthiness and sustainability, a position to that point taken by no food culture um, anywhere in the world. A few months after the opening of Noma, we invited a very diverse group of stakeholders to a Nordic kitchen symposium, where we asked the question, coming from very different realities, are we allowed to dream of one day handing over to our children a food culture that is so much more delicious, admirable, and responsible than the one we have inherited from our parents? And what could be the concrete benefits, benefits for us and for the world if we actually made it? Also, the Nordic Cuisine Manifesto was signed in 2004 by the, until that moment, um, top Francophile chefs of the region. The meaning of Noma was never to be the best. And the purpose of the Nordic Cuisine movement was not to build an introvert, elitarian brotherhood reserved for biodynamic farmers and wannabe Michelin stars. From the very beginning, we thought of this movement as a benign virus, an informal movement driven not by a desire for short-term profits, but by the joy of building value together. There was never an answer book, a logo or a precedent, never any rules to obey, only an appealing set of values resonating with the global zeitgeist. Fired up by the experience of starting Noma, I wanted to test the same approach, the concept of starting with a big idea, but this time in a much more narrow field. So in 2009, provoked by the absurd absence of healthy, delicious bread, with a high whole grain content, baked from organic grain, cultivated by local farmers, we decided we wanted to try to change bread. Instead of just tumbling into the market overnight, screaming out our own virtues from the ivory tower, we started the journey with a pop-up bakery at the Roskilde Music Festival. We are at Roskilde year with Meyers Bageri and Deli, som a protest against the internationale fast og junk food konglomerater. Og jeg vil gerne øh, fortælle jer meget kort en historie om, hvordan jeres brød bliver bedre end noget, I nogensinde har bagt. Regel nummer et, hvidt brød er noget lort. Vi er nødt til at have noget kimerklid, en lille smule fuldkornsmel med ned i melet. Regel nummer to, der skal mere vand i dejen. Der skal mere vand i dejen. Problemet er, at alle brødopskrifter Alle. Mere vand i dejen! Regel nummer tre. Ælt som ind i helvede. I skal ælte 10-15 minutter. Regel nummer tre. Det er mere sejt! 
De skal op omkring 25 gram salt per kilo mel, fordi salten fremmer brødsmager korn. Og det næste der er lang hævetid. Normalt så hæver man 50 gram gær, står der. Og så hæver man to timer, mens man går på toilettet, og så bærer man brød. Det er løgn! Det her er en Man kan ikke få et godt brød frem på to timer. Man skal planlægge lortet, og man skal give det de 8 timer, det skal have. Eller 16 eller 24. Så regel nummer 5 handler om at gå ned i gærmængde. Kan I se det? Gå ned i gærmængde! 1, 2, 3! Sådan! En gang til! 1, 2, 3! For når man kommer ned i gærmængde, så kommer man op i havetid. Og den lange havetid, det gør, at brødet på naturlig måde danner mælkesyrebakterier. Og det fantastiske med mælkesyrebakterier er, at de gør kornets næringsstoffer tilgængelige for kroppen. Er det en god idé, at kornets næringsstoffer bliver tilgængelige for kroppen? Yeah! Og den sidste regel, det er faktisk bare, at man skal bage sit brød i en varm ovn. Mange opfølgelser skriver 180 grader, 190 grader, 185 grader. Ovnen skal være varm! I, i Merko kan man købe en stenplade til 198 kroner. Den kan man bryde ind i ind i en vilken som helst ovn. Og så kan man varme stenpladen op, og når den er varm, så kan man bage i stenovn. Yeah! Så det var sådan set bare det. Fedt I kom. Tak for det, jeg støttede os hernede. Og så er der gratis brød til alle sammen. <laughs> Thank, thanks a lot. Um, to me, the most uh, important learning from that experience was that you kind of uh, come across with so much more authority and credibility when you share an idea at the moment where you have close to nothing to sell. We all know that uh, the overarching problem within the context of food is how to feed a growing population with healthy food within planetary boundaries. Our current food systems i don't want to delve into that, but they are unsustainable, they are unhealthy, they are extremely unjust and very unequal. And the complexity of the problem can be, uh, to put it mildly, overwhelming. In 2010, I decided to try to do something about it. I established the Melting Pot Foundation with the purpose to explore if what we had learned from starting Oma and the Nordic Cuisine Movement could be used to combat poverty. We got a little bit sidetracked to begin with and suddenly found ourselves in the game of resocialization, building and operating uh, food schools in prisons in a partnership with the Danish Prison Service. But we kind of got out. Um, and then in 2012, together with Ibis Denmark and with the Danish governmental investment fund IFU as a financial partner, we established the combined restaurant and food school Um, Gusto in the poorest capital of Latin America, La Paz in Bolivia. It hasn't been a walk in the park, but the team led by Camila Seidler and Michelangelo Zestari have produced amazing results. 52 students have graduated from Gusto's two-year-long apprenticeship model, a number of them have now opened their own restaurants. We have helped establish the Bolivian food movement, MIGA, and the annual street food festival, Tambo. Gusto has established 12 micro-institutions, the so-called mangas, in a partnership with a Dutch NGO called ECO. So far, 2,500 students have graduated from the small schools located in the slums of La Paz, El Alto, that also offer a cheap daily lunch made from local produce. The restaurant itself was cash flow positive in 2015. And in 2016, Gusto was voted number 14 on the list of Latin America's best restaurants. Camila Seidler was voted best female chef on the continent by her colleagues. And the president, Evo Morales, who otherwise can be pretty hostile to people messing up with his affairs, told the New York Times that Gusto is one of the three main reasons to visit Bolivia. And next month, it seems he is personally, on behalf of the government, giving the Bolivian team a prominent award. I sometimes have wondered how René and Michelangelo and Camilla have, with their teams, been able to overcome all the obstacles we have met in these kind of utopian projects. 
Danish author Peter Bastian gives one answer in his book Apprenticeship. He says it, he puts it this way, in math as well as in music and in life, when against all odds, you try to achieve something truly extraordinary, something distinctively good, then the simple beauty of the idea may fertilize the process and deliver solutions you could never ever rationally have dreamt up. What, what I get from these words is that maybe sometimes we need to ignore the accountant, the spreadsheets, the business plans, and just follow our hearts. In a very strange way, the Bolivian initiative took me to New York. Some of you have heard about Agon and the Great Northern Food Hall in, at the Grand Central Terminal. But what I personally have been looking really forward to is the opening this spring of a food school, a restaurant, and a bakery and a radio station in Brownsville, Brooklyn, one of New York City's most vibrant, but also one of its most historically underserved neighborhoods. Literally a ghetto uh, with 75,000 predominantly African-American and African-Caribbean people, out of which 40,000 live under the UNDP level of poverty. The ultimate goal of this last melting pot initiative is once more to try to become a smart ensign before we run out of time that impacts the community outside the walls of our institution. We dream of helping release the full potential of the people of Brownsville and of their food culture. I hope for 17 that, I, that we succeed in bringing the crown princes of Denmark and our prime ministers of Brownsville together, invited by the Brownsvillians, obviously, to listen to the needs of the community. I believe that maybe just 30 minutes or 45 minutes of presence could benefit Brownsville in ways our fantasy doesn't even allow us to imagine and maybe benefit Denmark as well. CNN may come and who knows what then could happen. I am, uh, I think I am running out of time. So uh, let me just l make this last thing very clear. Melting Pot will never be one of the most successful not-for-profit operations in uh, the United States of America, but that is also not the point. Here comes the point. <laughs> so the point is that legend has it that one day there was a tremendous forest fire. The terrified and shocked animals all watched the disaster, unable to help in any way. Only the little hummingbird bustled about back and forth, fetching a few drops of water at a time in its small beak to throw them on the fire. After a while, the armadillo, who was irritated by this pathetic display, said, Hummingbird, are you crazy? Do you think that you're going to put out the fire with these little drops of water? The hummingbird answered, I know I can't, but I'm doing my part. Thank you. <laughs>